to Intro to Cultural Anthropology. This is Lecture 12, Politics, uh, Power, and Political Violence. Uh, we've now met for 12 video lectures in a row, and you're probably thinking to yourself, man, that guy can just talk. Well, we're going to take it relatively easy today. Um, let's kind of uh, go through some of the terminology and uh, do it at a a slower pace. There will be um, three segments to this lecture, and uh, try to make it a little more laid back because uh, whew, that's a lot of information we've gone through so far. Uh, if I were to say to you, all societies, if they are to remain viable over time, must maintain social order. Every society must develop a set of customs and procedures for making and enforcing decisions, resolving disputes and regulating the behavior of its members. In the last two lectures prior to this, we talked about common interest groups and, uh, and, and groups um, that uh, focus on uh, class and uh, sex. In the prior discussion, we talked about families and households, and as more and more families come together, um, we have problems um, keeping them together and uh, regulating their behavior. So in this, we're gonna talk about those uh, particular groups and how societies have maintained um, uh, organization. In the 17th century, Louis the Fourteenth uh, said, I am the state. Well, what did he mean by this when he said, I am the state? He was saying that he was the absolute ruler of France and that all laws, the lawmaking, the judge, the jury, the executioner, all of that revolved around him. He had all political power. Um, that's not so much true in our own society where um, political power is broken up into you know, three different branches, uh, the executive, legislative, and um, judicial. And then when we look at um, our state institutions, we look at, you know, they have their own um, executive, judicial, uh, and legislative, and then within your own community, your own town, you have those who share and split political power. And then that may not be true in your household. Uh, some people in your household have, have more power over another. So let's just look at how anthropologists study political organization. And we'll start with uh, four terms that you need to be familiar with. That's bands, tribes, chiefdoms, and the state. Uh, for me, uh, I don't think that you can lump all societies in these four classifications, but these are just a means for us to discuss um, political organization. I don't necessarily believe uh, that uh, subgroups within our society fall within these categories, but uh, with that being said, it's important to know what uh, we're talking about, right? The first is the smallest, and that's a band. This is the oldest form of political organization. Um, a band can constitute from anywhere to 10 to 20 members to several hundred. Uh, a band is a small group of related households that occupy a particular region that gather periodically on an ad hoc basis, uh, but do not yield any sovereignty to a larger collective. There's nobody that uh, is higher than them that controls bands. Generally, bands are food-gathering nomadic people. Um, there's no or little concept of individual property ownership. Um, they place a high value on sharing, cooperation, and reciprocity. There's very little role specialization, and these societies are highly egalitarian in that there are few differences in wealth and status. In bands, they are mostly related by blood or marriage. Uh, they live in extended family groups. They camp together. Um, they share a common language. Uh, they have general cultural features that are similar to one another. Uh, there's no political allegiances to anybody. Uh, their political life is also their social life, where uh, economics, religion, and family are all interconnected and integrated. We talked about cultures being integrated. Uh, their political and social life are one and the same. Uh, when we talk about leadership amongst bands, their leadership is relatively informal. Uh, leadership is based on ability and service to your group. Uh, usually older members in the society who have um, 
lived longer lifetimes have more, there's more confidence uh, in their ability to make judgment uh, decisions. There's no specific time length or um, designated period in which somebody is considered a leader. It varies. Uh, a group that we would consider a type of band would be the Johansi Bushmen of Africa. Um, the Johansi Bushmen do have a term for uh, their leaders as head, we call the term headsmen. These positions are sometimes hereditary, that means they pass through patrilineal lines. Um, a headsman has no responsibility in the hunting or making uh, marriage arrangements or um, negotiating marriage arrangements. Uh, they're not a judge of the people. They have no greater material power or wealth over other members of their society. Their sole responsibility is to make good decisions about where that group, this, that band, will move to after the resources are exploited in that area. They're a hunting and gathering nomadic group. Um, the headsman is responsible for moving that one, that band, to another area that has the appropriate resources of water, food, and shelter. What happens though when a headsman in the Johansi Bushman um, moves the band to an area that is not suitable for living? Well, that headsman won't be the leader anymore and they'll choose somebody else who has the, the judgment and the confidence that they will lead them to a safer location that has the appropriate resources. So again, there's um, it's a very informal political system uh, and it's uh, organized around a small group of people. This will lead us to our next group and that is a tribe. So moving, if you're looking at it as a hierarchical pyramid, as the smallest being a band to the largest being a state, we're now moving to the next rung which is a tribe. Our definition of a tribe is a tribe is a group of nominally independent communities which occupy a specific region and share a common language and whose culture is integrated by some unifying factor. Um, in anthropology uh, we look at separate bands or villages that are integrated by factors such as clans that unite people uh, and that can be separated by communities or age grades or associations. These are the things that we talked about last week uh, that cross kinship or territorial boundaries. But looking at tribes, tribes are mostly horticultural and pastoral um, groups. They are egalitarian. Uh, there's no marked differences in status, rank, and power, and wealth. Things that we discussed earlier in, a, in the earlier lectures. Local leaders uh, have no central authority, which means, yes, they may a tribe may have a recognized uh, leader, um, but he's um, a leader based on virtue. They may be based on wisdom or integrity or intelligence or has a concern for the welfare of his tribal members or her tribal members. Again, local leadership is informal and temporary. The example that we're going to give is the Navajo. The Navajo fall under the political organization of a tribe. Uh, the Navajo, their leaders uh, are concerned with, their, uh, with, the, with the public, with the group. The leaders and then the members abide to group decisions and these group decisions determine when to withdraw cooperation or when to um, in, involve cooperation within his, their tribal members. One of the biggest problems in uh, the, the Navajo tribe is uh, stress. Some of the stress can be caused and uh, reverberated by gossip and criticism. The tribal leaders then, uh, their responsibility is to prevent gossip and criticism because it leads to the breakdown of cooperative bonds which leads to the breakdown of the tribe. So they believe, the Navajo believe, that in these antisocial behaviors cause physical disease. So uh, the duty of the tribal leaders is to prevent and to stop gossip and criticism. Other types of tribes um, include the Melanesians and the Melanesians have a formal uh, term for their leader and they use and we, that term being um, 
uh, translated as big man. The big man has the interests and welfare of his tribe, uh, but he also has a lot of self-interest uh, and uses his uh, position of power to uh, lead to personal gain. All right. Again, we look at the Western New Guinea group that we've talked about quite a bit, and that's the Kapakau Ka -pa Ka -pa of Western New Guinea. Their big man is known as Tonawi, which is translated as rich one. In this society, the headman of a village is the wealthiest man and is considered successful and admirable. Um, he is considered a big man and given a position of Tonawi, Tonawi uh, because he is generous. He makes a lot of loans out to his, his members of his, of his tribe. Um, though a wealthy man who refuses to lend money to others may be ostracized, ridiculed, and actually executed uh, by the group uh, of warriors uh, because he's not living up to his duty as being the wealthiest and most generous, he is to spread that um, wealth around. Uh, again, remember, uh, he has the self-interest uh, in mind, and he wants to maintain being the richest one. So by giving away a lot of his, uh, his wealth and his uh, property and his pigs, um, that will lower his status. So again, it's a, it's a very fine line between generosity and self-interest. Um, wealth is, uh, is determined by the amount of pigs that you have. Um, political relationships are based on kinship ties and acquiring pigs from other members. Um, a big man will also gain his power by physical prowess, strength, skill, luck, um, skill being the ability to negotiate uh, uh, exchanges. Um, those who show bad management or uh, a lack of generosity, they'll be removed uh, from a position of leadership. So uh, these are examples of different tribes, and we focused on uh, two of them. Uh, there's more examples in your book, so please read the chapter and be familiar with um, how a tribe differs from a band. Again, when we talk about the difference between bands and tribes, one of the prevailing differences is size. Uh, now we're talking about hundreds to thousands of people that constitute a tribe, and not just the tens to hundreds which constitutes a band. Um, there are also changes. The positions of leadership are more recognized and, and becoming more and more formal. In a chiefdom, which is the next stage after a tribe, uh, a chiefdom is a regional polity in which two or more local groups are organized under a single chief, who is at the head of a ranked hierarchy of people. Uh, in the society, it's the chief and his family and everybody else. Uh, hereditary uh, leadership is passed from uh, one person to his, or own, to his or her son or daughter. Right? Uh, it can be through patrilineal or matrilineal lines. Uh, the chief, his position is to unite his people in all affairs and all times. His duty is to distribute lands among community uh, members and to recruit people for military or for other forms of service, uh, for social service. Uh, in the economy, he is to redistribute the, re, uh, the surplus that uh, they, they may uh, gather. He is to also control that uh, surplus, so he amasses an uh, amount of wealth. Our example that we're going to use of chiefdoms is the 18th century pre-colonial Hawaiian Islands. Uh, there are eight islands, and they were composed of three basic strata in society. Uh, when it were refer, referred to um, the different um, groups of people within this chiefdom. The first is the Ali, -I, A -L -I, apostrophe I. This group were the major chiefs. Uh, they were descendants of gods. Their close relatives were often served as their advisors and their bureaucrats. So at the top of this pyramid, you have the Eli. The next is the Konokik, K-O-N-O-D, uh, K-O-N-O-K-I-K, -K, the Konokik. These are the less important chiefs who were the distant relatives of the Eli. 
So in the hierarchy, you have the Alaii and the Konokik, and the last group is the Makaianaia, which is the great majority. And there were, it was kind of like the, the caste system that we talked about uh, in uh, India, where you were, if you were this lower group, you were no longer allowed to interbreed with the two groups ab above you. Uh, in the Hawaiian chiefdoms, agri agriculture revolved around uh, taro, red fruit, yams, and coconuts. Um, the LII organized uh, the, the, the great majority for irrigation projects. Uh, uh, we talked about chiefdoms organizing uh, groups for military service and also for irrigation. We'll take a little break here. As you notice, we've moved locations during the uh, uh, lecture, we were getting a little loud, so uh, we were asked to move into a private conference room. But where we left off, um, chiefs had considerable power and authority over their population in Hawaii. Uh, the chief controlled communal labor, the artisans, and they gathered people for war. Uh, moving on to our last definition uh, within political organizations, that's the state. The state is a centralized political system with the power to coerce. These populations are quite large um, in a state. Uh, managing the welfare of their population is a priority because the population is so large. And that includes irrigation, market systems. They need specialized urban area sectors to con um, and in these specialized urban sectors we have a, a diverse number of um, subcultures and with that um, there's a emphasis on uh, ethnic differentiation, uh, social conflicts and, to, and stresses to resolve uh, some of the issues that we have when populations get too large. Um, we see the creation of militaries and bureaucracies and, a, and there may be an officially recognized religion. Um, just to try to make the society function as a whole. Uh, if we look at our own society and we look at um, the United States falling under the state, um, we're composed of a lot of uh, different groups and how do we, how does one go about uh, making sure and appeasing everybody and making sure everybody feels safe uh, and has the basic uh, resources that everyone requires. So let's kind of self-reflect we do live in a state, but there's a difference uh, between states and nations. Um, there's over 5,000 nations in the world. There's only really 181 states, okay? Um, when we talk about the anthropological definitions between a, a nation and a state, we're talking about the difference in a nation. A nation might share a language, uh, cultures, uh, may have a territorial base, um, may have an organized political organization and have a history. Um, in the world, most state nations are multinational. Made. About 73% of uh, nations are multinational. Uh, we would consider the United States uh, a mega state, but it's also a nation, right? In uh, nations, one example is the Yamamami. Um, the Yamamami live in Brazil and Venezuela. They don't have a territorial base. They belong to two independent nations. Um, uh, other states include the Swazi of Swaziland, the Bantu of South uh, East Africa, who are farmers and cattle herdsmen who cross national borders. Um, the interesting thing about the Bantu is the Bantu have a dual monarchy. Even though some of the nations might be um, uh, capitalist or uh, they have a, a distinctly different type of uh, political system in their nation, the Bantu still uh, have a monarchy and they have a dual monarch. They have the king and his mother. Uh, in this, their political system, they have high courts, they have gatherings. Uh, their system is, uh, their society is broken down by age classes. Um, in these courts, uh, the uh, king and his mother might allocate land to its members. Uh, they distribute the national wealth. Um, they organize social gatherings and rituals. Uh, the uh, advisors to the mother and the king are, are, are relatives. Um, the advisors include two tinsilla, 
which are the blood, uh, the blood brothers of the king, and he, they are to serve and protect him. His advisors also include two ten, uh, tenvuna, which are counselors, and they uh, counsel him on civil and military duties. Um, so the people, uh, so the male um, uh, advisors include blood relatives. Um, so you have the king and his mother, who are the dual monarchs. They have a number of advisors that help and protect them and organize uh, the interests of the larger community. At the lower level, uh, each village has a private council and a council to the state, which uh, represents the, the smaller groups, and those look, uh, include the Lococo and La Banda. The Lococo, or it's a private council made up of senior princes. Uh, the La Banda is a council of state that includes chiefs and headsmen. And uh, in their society, the smallest unit is the homestead. And as you move up from homestead to uh, those who regulate um, uh, regional groups, uh, they move into the larger uh, uh, community of the Batu that was controlled, that is controlled by the king and his mother. And uh, the issues that start from the homestead and move their way up um, get resolved by the different degrees of um, those who are in authoritarian positions. All right. uh, so uh, there's a difference between nations and states. Uh, states, there's a significantly smaller number of states and they don't necessarily are restricted to a territorial base. Um, they don't necessarily have a strict coherent political organization even though the Bantu does. Uh, they do share a language and a common culture where in, in some nations uh, even though there is a common language and common culture, they may be devised of multiple subcultures and people may speak multitude of languages as we know from our own nation, which is a multinational nation and is composed of different cultures and different subcultures, even though we are considered a mega state. In this last segment, which we're starting now, uh, we'll talk about political leadership and gender. Uh, when we think of political leadership, and we think and we have a tendency to think of uh, gender, and we think of males. Um, we talk about breaking the glass ceiling in economics, but we can also say that in political roles. In the past, we've seen women as political leaders. Um, the the Squasakams were women chiefs of New England. Uh, in the Hawaiian Islands, women served as chiefs. Uh, Queen Elizabeth I and Queen Elizabeth II, Catherine the Great, Cleopatra, Queen Hetzetza. These were all um, politically dominant women in their societies. Uh, in modern times, we're seeing more and more women as uh, political leaders, including the Philippines, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Norway, India, Israel, Great Britain. Uh, in 2013, where this video is being filmed, in the state of New Hampshire, all major political positions are held by women, the governor, the senators, uh, the mayor of Nashville are, are women. So we have in society, we are seeing as we talk about cultures changing and cultures are adaptive, our idea of women in power is changing and it's perceptively uh, different than it was 50 to 100 years ago. When we look at um, other institutions, let's talk about political leadership in women. Um, generally, there's a perception that there's low visibility in societies. Um, and, and they're excluded from the realm of social control. In West Africa, there was, there's a dual system for uh, political control. The Igbo of Nigeria have two separate political institutions for males and females. Uh, the males, the head of each political institution for the males is called the Obai. He is the head of the government. But there is also a female, Omu and she is the mother of the community. Um, both are crowned as the head of their society, um, but they're not married, nor is the Omu the daughter of the Obai. They're not related by, um, by blood uh, or through marriage. So there's the Obai and the Omu and their job is to regulate um, and control 
their people, the Igbo. Um, both has a council of advisors, and uh, both um, have a location to meet with representatives from other villages that have disputes or issues. Um, the Obai and the Omu is to s establish rules and regulations for community uh, members. The Omu control and regulate community markets, or the Obai control and regulate uh, military and service obligations. Um, in cases where it involves both women and men, let's say marriage disputes, or um, uh, disputes, disputes regarding territory and land, both the Omai and the Omu, Obai Omu, will meet and cooperate with one another and their councils to resolve the issues. One of the examples um, would be, when is um, it appropriate for a woman to mourn her dead husband? That is something that is controlled by the Omu and her council. Uh, when, it, it just, when it's um, describing the um, uh, inheritance of members of a family after a death that includes both male and female lines, that's when both parties, the, the Obai and the Omu, come together to negotiate and to resolve the differences and issues. So here is uh, two groups uh, coming together. Now the problem happened uh, with this where uh, the system existed up until uh, British colonial rule where the uh, Igbo recognized the importance of both male and female um, political leadership. But the British failed to recognize the autonomy and power that women possessed, and they imposed their own um, culture on the Igbo of Nigeria. And what happened is that the women lost their equality and became subordinate to men. And this led to the change in their society where uh, a male a political power was more important based on uh, another culture influencing um, their system. Uh, we use the term cultural loss, and we'll define that more, but there's an example of when another uh, society dominates and changes and alters another culture. Um, and we call this cultural loss, and we also uh, have another term, because they were um, uh, being uh, uh, integrated and colonized, uh, they became acculturated uh, to uh, the British and their culture. Uh, to maintain order, we have a number of different ways, uh, uh, well, anthropologists study different ways in which a society will maintain and control uh, its population. One is through cultural control. Cultural control is the control through beliefs and values deeply internalized in the minds of individuals. Um, cultural We'll give you examples of cultural control, but first let's talk about social control. Social control is a control over groups through overt coercion. Um, social control includes things like sanctions and laws. Sanctions are externalized social controls designed to encourage conformity to social norms. Um, and these sanctions are found in all societies of different sizes. Um, sanctions can be positive and negative. Uh, some of the negative forms of uh, sanctions include imprisonment or ostracism or corporal punishment. Some of the more positive forms of sanctions include um, awards or prizes, including uh, the Nobel Peace Prize is a form of sanction. It's an award given to um, people in the fields and they recognize them for their service or for their intellect. Um, a law is a type of formal negative sanction. Uh, a law is to regulate behavior. Um, types of social control through law, um, these are covered in your book. You can um, look at the definitions of law and the fun we, we recognize what the function of the law is. So we don't really need to go in, into great detail about that. So these are forms of social control, sanctions and laws. Types of cultural control are interesting. Um, let's reflect and think about how our culture is controlled and regulated. Do we not have um, certain agencies that have been established to control our behavior? For example, what we can say on television or the radio, that would be the FCC. 
right? So our beliefs and values are sometimes controlled, um, and sometimes this control um, is internalized and uh, uh, it's hard to define whether it is a form of, of cultural control. If we, um, if you look at your household and how you're brought up, some of the rules and behaviors um, and how you interact outside the household is a form of cultural control. Um, let's look and read the book and look at some examples uh, of the difference between cultural and social control. And let's look at some of the ways that they, different, they differ. All right. With that being said, one of the forms of cultural control that we're going to discuss in our next lecture topic is religion. Uh, so make sure that at the end you're finished with uh, today's topic, which is uh, chapter uh, topic 12, which is political uh, power. Uh, please do the reading assignments and uh, watch the other ethnographic video that pertains to this type of topic. And uh, we'll be moving on to religion and religion as a form of cultural control. Uh, all right, and religion as an important integrated aspect to society. So again, um, have a good day. Make sure you're on top of your reading assignments and your current events. And make sure that you're reading um, your ethnographic uh, review, the Bushi, and make sure we're on top of the reading so that you can uh, compose your five-page book review. All right, have a good day, and we'll see you tomorrow.